faithful to every promise that he's ever made you. You know, so many times we think we need some big extravagant script of how to just praise the Lord. I love him, and that's all I need to say tonight. So let's do that together. Would you just quiet yourself of all the stuff and just concentrate on Jesus tonight? And let's worship him together. Let's pray. My Father, I thank you for the privilege we have together in this place once again. And Father, as you have the past uh, two days and the past three services, Lord, we just give it to you and ask for you to settle down amongst us, Father. Just allow the Holy Spirit to move in and out of every pew. And Father, help us to be faithful to listen and hear what you have for each of us tonight. So Lord, in every song that's sung, every word that's spoken, may you be glorified in you alone. And we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I like singing about the blood. Stand as we sing. It'll never lose its power. Thank you. 
sickness, no pain, and no more parting over there. But what just about puts me on shouting ground tonight, church, is that forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day. What a glorious day that will be. That's worth shouting about tonight, folks. Let's sing it again. I think we need to sing it one more time, all right?
Houston. What a day. Woo. You know, just to think about, we're not going to have to have faith there. It'll all be right there in front of us. What a day. What a day that's going to be. Praise his name. Well, if our ushers will come tonight, we'll receive this evening's offering, and I'll let you know uh, the offerings each night this week are going to support the cost of the revival, so uh, dig deep and uh, help us out tonight, all right? The Bible also says the Lord likes a cheerful giver, so be careful. <laughs> be careful you don't get in too much pain, all right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to give back uh, to you, Father. We can never outgive you, and we just know tonight that you have blessed us with the ability to give back. So, Father, I pray you bless the gift and the giver tonight, Father, and just bless uh, this night. We pray we thank you for your presence we already feel. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. the victory tonight, right? So uh, we pulled this one out, and uh, we went through it the other night, what, two or three, four times, uh, and we think we've got it right. If we don't, just uh, pretend that we do, all right? But listen more to the message than it is the messengers leading you. But what a great song Chris Tomlin recorded this years ago. I'm looking forward to this day when I will rise. No more sorrow, no more pain. 
this to know tonight. What a hope we have tonight. Amen. That one day, no more sorrow, no more pain. What a day that's going to be. As we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, I would ask that you uh, continue to pray for my kids. Uh, we uh, had them stay home tonight and uh, just uh, blow their nose elsewhere. And they're doing a, a lot of that. So uh, just continue to lift them up in prayer. Uh, Fran has caught that nasty cold as well. And uh, she told Greta, she said, uh, I haven't been out of bed all day. Uh, so just uh, lift Fran up that God will give her a touch tonight. So uh, it's that season where we go from 40 to 60 and everybody gets sick. So uh, wash your hands is all I'm telling you. Well, wash your hands and uh, take stock in Kleenex because it's that time of the year. But uh, if you'll just lift them up tonight, that would certainly be appreciated. Continue to stay, pray for Steve uh, tonight with uh, the things uh, feeling a little better today. But uh, still has a little ways to go. So just continue to uh, lift him up and uh, just pray for one another. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If we're not praying for each other, who's praying for us, right? So we need to lift one another up. So it's good to have Kurt Neese here. He is the pastor at Calvary Baptist Church tonight here in uh, Richmond. We're glad you're here tonight. Kurt, w would you pray for us tonight, Kurt? I would appreciate that. So there's a, a group of, of guys that meet, uh, pastors that meet every Wednesday morning. And uh, Reuben uh, has let me know about it. And, and we just go to each other's churches. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to make it <laughs> to the other ones. But uh, we've got, had just a, a great joy to uh, meet Kurt and Dave Steely, who will be back tomorrow night. He told me uh, he'll be here. But. Uh, it's good when we can take down those denominational barriers and realize that we're Christians and we're all on the same team. And uh, that's the only thing that is great. I'm glad tonight he knows my name. Amen. He counts the stars one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shore, sees every sparrow that falls. He made the mountains and the sea, he's in control of everything, every creature great and small. He knows my name, every step that I take, every move that Every tear that I cry, he knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain, can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, cause he knows my name. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, I don't know what store I don't know a lot of things I don't have all the answers to the questions of life but I know in whom I have believed and he knows my name every step that I take every move that I make 
every tear that I cry. He knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. Can't see the light of day. I know I'll be just fine. He knows my name. He Loves us enough. The Bible says he has every hair on our head counted. Yeah, right. That's how much he cares for us. Yeah. <laughs> heard that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Amen. Somebody else. Uh, you know what? Go right ahead. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Praise God. Woo. Hallelujah. Somebody else tonight. Take your liberty. That's right. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. Lord. Anybody else tonight?
didn't we? Come too far to turn back now. Amen. That's for sure. Anybody else tonight? Sure, go ahead. Go right ahead, brother. Yes. Bless you, brother. Glad you're here. Amen. We're glad you're here. Amen. Wes, go ahead, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Wes, I can promise you there ain't a one of us in this room don't love you bigger. I can tell you that. I told somebody the other day, I said, if you need a warm hug, Wes can give that to you. So, And I'm thankful for those warm hugs. So, Anybody else tonight? Yeah. Sylvia, go ahead.
get to join in one of these days. Won't that be good? Amen. Go. God's good, folks. Isn't he? God's good. You know, I'm thankful tonight that um, God just knew what we needed, Scott. And uh, I know, uh, Karen, your your post on Facebook um, speaks volumes to what God's doing in this revival and how he is changing hearts and changing lives and helping us. And I'm just excited about what God has for us to hear tonight. So uh, just allow the Holy Spirit to minister as Scott comes to preach tonight. <laughs> Love you, man. There you go. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, but it actually gets easier each time I've done it. <laughs> I, was, I thought it would have been the opposite of that. <laughs> well, you know, the Lord does know your name. I mean, he knows us all personally. And so, you know, where does that personalness really begin between man and God? I mean, the real the depth of per, the way in which we could know God, where did that... Uh, really start, and those of you who have been with us the past couple services, you probably know where we're headed here. Uh, yeah, I mean, you might say uh, when God first created man, formed him from the dust of the ground, it was a deeply personal uh, moment between God and man, and it was. There's no denying the personalness, personalness of that. Uh, you might say when Jesus was born uh, and uh, God became a man, I mean, that's pretty personal. Uh, it, and there's no denying the personalness of that. But 
You see, what God had been wanting to do all along is get inside of us. And so the Pentecost, just gave away the farm with that word, Pentecost is, is, is not something that just suddenly happened because the church prayed, oh Lord, won't you come? Pentecost has been a moment, an event, that was on the calendar of Almighty God from the beginning of time. This was the moment where God was going to get more personal than he had ever gotten, where the Holy Spirit would come and God could actually get inside of us. Can you you imagine that? I hope you can more than imagine that. I hope you can live that. That God is inside of us. How personal is that? Whew. Man. Okay, I'm ready to go. So tonight we're going to look at the day of Pentecost. If you, I'm sure you've guessed, guessed that by now, and it probably wasn't much of a guess. So I, I'd like us to kind of uh, think as we, by the way, let me, let me just hesitate for a minute. I'd really like to say thank you to all of you. I, I really need to do that. You are a gracious group of people. You've been very kind. I just love being here. And I, and, I, and I really honestly feel like we are on a journey together through these couple of chapters of Acts. And I just want to thank you for letting me be part of all this. You know, I'm, real, I'm, I'm enjoying the journey with you. I think God has had some important things for us to, 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 to share. Some of it's been a little hard, you know. Sometimes God needs to deal with us about things that we don't want to talk about, that we don't want to deal with. I mean, I... That's certainly the case in my life. But that's just a loving God doing that. I mean, he loves us so much that he refuses to leave us where he finds us. And we very often say those couple of phrases, and we're referring to the time when we became Christians, but I'm here to tell you today that God refuses to leave you where he's finding you right now today. I mean, he, he loves you enough that he wants, he wants to have more of you, and he wants to give more of himself to you. And we, there's just no place in the history of humanity where we see that more than in the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost was a supernatural occurrence like no other day that had ever happened in the, in the history of, of the world, really, in the history of the universe. God was doing it again. You see, this is, this is even though Pentecost was unique because of the personal mission of God getting inside of us what he intended to do all along, at the same time there's some things that that he had done before that are kind of similar here, and that is there are these grandiose moments in the scriptures where God himself kind of rips through the veil that separates time and eternity, and he does stuff. And it's only happened four other times. This is, this is only the fourth time that God has ever done that, Pentecost, really done it in that way. It happened first when time began. We just alluded to that a couple of seconds ago. When God created the heavens and the earth, and he breathed the life, breath of life into Adam, and he became a living soul. Uh, that, that was God stepping through that veil that separates time and eternity and getting personal with, with, with humanity. It happened a second time when a sinless baby boy was miraculously conceived in the virgin womb of a sin-fallen teenage girl. God burst through that veil that separates time and eternity. And it happened a third time just days prior to Pentecost, and we talked about this last time, when the disciples witnessed that same sinless adult that had been born of a virgin rise from the earth and return to his timeless and rightful position at the Father's hand. At that time, it was Jesus going from here through the veil that separates time and eternity. And now God was about to do it again. It was, it was going to happen again. And this time it was going to be like nothing that had ever happened before. And there's going to be a lot of things about the day of Pentecost that we like to analyze. And usually we don't just analyze. Usually, we overanalyze. <laughs> analysis is tough for us to control. 
When we start analyzing, we, we engage in paralysis by analysis. <laughs> you know, I mean, we just, there's just so, we just get so analytical. And these three sort of outward manifestations of phenomenon that happened as the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, we've taken each of those and, and, and made great theological treatises of them. Uh, and, and, and so it's so easy to miss the point of what Pentecost was really all about. When we start focusing on the outward manifestations, we began to lose touch with what was happening inside of us. God was doing a new thing. It was an amazing thing. And so tonight, we are going to talk about what happened to the disciples at Pentecost. We are going to mention those three things, but it's going to be brief. But we're mostly going to focus on what happened through the disciples. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to take a look at Acts 1.8, which we've already read, and then we're going to jump into the, the meat of the passage here, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This incredible connection between this verse and what we're about to read in chapter 2. But you will receive power... When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And now we're skipping down to chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Remember, you'll be my witnesses in all these places. In Jerusalem, when this happened, there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men speaking? Aren't they not Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Judea Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Man. Whew. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. There, there it is again. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Lord, we thank you for this monumental event. What does this mean to us? What does this mean to the church? Help us, Lord, as we work through these verses to come away tonight filled with you that we might walk into our world, into our community, and make a difference filled with you. But what does that mean when we're filled with you? What will happen to us if we're filled with you? Help us, Lord, to see that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can be seated. Well, you already were being seated before I said that. But you don't need me to tell you. <clears throat> so let's let's take a look now at these uh, first, uh, first verse. Uh, we're going to ask this question, and there's only two points here to the sermon, and I know that's breaking the law. It's supposed to, it's supposed to be three points. I know, I know. But only two here tonight. But if it makes you feel any better about the three points, the second point's really long. And if that doesn't make you feel well, I'll just tell you that the first point, this is going to be short. <laughs> so what happened to them? What happened to the disciples? And so... Jesus told them what would happen to them, 
in chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of, and to the, ends of the earth. We can never lose touch with what happened at Pentecost. We can never divorce it. We can never disconnect it with what Jesus said was going to happen to them. I mean, this, this is the catalyst of what Pentecost and what being filled with the Holy Spirit is all about. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, what does it mean to be his witnesses? Well, you're going to have to wait on that. But we're going to get there. So what happened to them? Let's look at these physical outward manifestations we call them, and we're going to be real short on this. We're not going to take a lot of time because this is the stuff that everyone always focuses on. And this is the stuff that causes us to miss what really happened. But we cannot talk about Pentecost and just blow by these things either. Because they're pretty special and pretty wonderful. So we see that there was a sound that came from heaven like the blowing of a violent wind, verse verse 7 says. Of course, as Scripture says, Luke here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he uses words like like and it seemed to. And we've taken these things literally like they must be this. And Luke is just trying to make some comparison to to his eyes as he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He heard this sound that was like the the blowing of a violent wind. Anybody here ever been in the middle of the blowing of a violent wind? Oh, man. I remember when we first came to Indiana, first left Maine and came to Indiana and went to Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Griffin type people around here will remember some of this. We had a tornado that came through there. And, and we had never been anywhere near a tornado before. Uh, you know, in Maine, we get blizzards. In the winter time. You know, we get three, three, two and a half, three feet of snow at a time. That's the, that's the big natural phenomenon that we're noted for. We never saw a tornado in our lives. And, and, so, and so we're kind of hunkering down, and this tornado comes through, and it, and it whiffs up over the neighborhood that we were in, and then it drops back down on the other side of the neighborhood. And you could drive down Scenic Drive towards 50, the back way, and you could see the swath that that thing cut through. Just bare, there was just, just bare dirt. It even uprooted all the grass. And I mean, you talk about a violent, rushing wind. Man. And so these guys were hearing something that sounded like that. I mean, to us, it sounded like a train going down the track. We were kind of hunkered down in the basement. I had the, our fellowship hall was in the basement of the parsonage, and it had two, kind of like a daylight basement on one end, had two garage doors that came up. We had one of the garage doors open, and, these, and the girls were hunkering down in the fellowship hall, and I'm standing out there. I was like, I want to see this thing. And Cheryl said, Get in here, you idiot! <laughs> She's right. <laughs> and so I, w- once things had started going a little ballistic, I'm like, okay, I'm going in there. <laughs> you know? and so, and we, so we saw the aftermath of it. But this mighty, vi- violent, rushing wind is something. And then Luke says that he, he saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that split and, and, la- and landed on them. Verse, the first part of verse three, 3 says that. Isn't, isn't that fascinating? Now, of course, you've heard all the comparisons about uh, purity and fire and this could be symbolic of that. And, and of course, we take the, all of these things. And th- the truth is, if we're really going to analyze these things, we end up doing whatever we want with them. That's the unfortunate thing. We take these outward manifestations because they're so mysterious and they're so unexplainable that we create our own explanations <laughs> for them. And you can read, you can come up with just about anything you want that you could imagine that these outward manifestations mean. And you can pick up a book somewhere that's already written exactly what you dreamed up in your imagination. It's been done over and over and over again. But really, kind of interestingly, this last phrase in these outward descriptions isn't outward at all. The the first part of uh, of 4a said, I haven't skipped the tongues thing. We're going to get there a little bit later. But the first part of verse 4 says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. God got inside of them. 
get in there. This is what he's been planning all along. This is the moment. This is when it happened. This is day one of the Christian church. This is the first day of Christianity as a church. This is the day that it began. This is the first day of the church age at the day of Pentecost. It's also the very first day of the last days. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Peter rising and preaching out of the book of Joel. Right on the heels of this. So these are the things that happened to them, minus one that we're going to get to. So let's talk about what happened through them. And this is where we're going to spend the, the rest of our time together. So Jesus also told them what would happen through them. Uh, well, let's just read it again. But you will receive power. That's something that happened to them. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, something that happened in them, and you will be my witnesses, something that happened through them. So what happened through them? We know it's witnessing, but what is that all about? Well, we, they spoke in languages. This is them witnessing now. This is why I saved this to the second point. They spoke in languages previously unknown to them. Fascinating. And the only biblical explanation here of tongue speaking, of, of Pentecostal tongues, is right here in this passage. Uh, Luke, again, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wanted us to be certain that this tongue speaking dynamic at Pentecost, I'm talking about Pentecost now, uh, was actual known languages. This four times down through this passage, he says he wants to make sure that we don't misunderstand this, and he wants to make sure that we don't do what we've done with it and take it and ma make it into some mysterious language that needs an interpreter, like the other passages in Corinthians that talks about. That's something else, actually. That's tongues. That's Greek word glossolalia, but that's not Pentecostal tongues. So Luke makes sure we understand what he's talking about. Uh, ver last phrase in verse 4, he says, in other tongues as the Spirit led them. Uh, last par uh, part of verse 5, he talks about every nation under heaven being there. Uh, last part of verse 6, it speaking in his own language. Again, uh, last part of verse 8, in his own native tongue. Four times Luke wants to make sure we understand that what the, what the, the speaking in tongues that happened at Pentecost was actual known languages. The miracle wasn't that it was some mysterious language. The miracle was these guys were speaking a real, actual language that they never knew. This happened on mission fields. Have you, have you heard stories? People go into a foreign land under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and, and they're trying their best with their fumbling through with their half-broken English and half-Spanish, let's say, just for example, and, and, and they get frustrated, and they thought, man, how am I going to minister to these people? And then the testimonies roll in. Oh, you speak beautiful Spanish. You've read the missions books over the years. <laughs> I mean, that's Pentecostal tongues. Because someone is hearing the gospel in their own language. So whatever the modern phenomenon of tongue speaking is, and I believe it can be, quantified elsewhere in scripture, so don't get me wrong on this, but that is not Pentecostal tongues, and it shouldn't be called that, shouldn't proclaim that as Pentecostal tongues, unless it occurs in the presence of one or more ethnic group who hear the wonders of God in their own native tongue. That is precisely what happened through the disciples on that day. This is precisely the mechanism that God used for them to be his witnesses to all these people groups who were right there. They didn't even have to go anywhere. <laughs> you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And guess what? You're going to do it by not going anywhere. Because they're coming to you from all over the known world. So 
They spoke in tongues previously unknown to them. They became worldwide witnesses without going to the wide world. Because the wide world came for them. <laughs> Incredible. Not only were the disciples miraculously speaking in multiple languages, but think what all those people would say when they returned home. I mean, think about it. Just put yourself in their shoes if you can. I mean, let, let's use our imaginations a little bit here tonight. What an imagination trip. <laughs> Don't you like using your imagination? How many of you like using your imagination? Some of you just don't have any imagination. Really. <laughs> but let, let's just try and put ourselves in their shoes. Just for a moment. If you were one, I'm not even talking about the disciples. If you were one of the people that were there on the day of Pentecost, you just came because, you know, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a feast of the tabernacle. That's what Pentecost is. This isn't the first time Pentecost. But this is a national Jewish holiday. That's why there were so many people there. And so you just came to the feast, like any other year, routine. And you watched this, you experienced this, you saw this phenomenon, you get caught up in this, these incredible miracles of God. <laughs> now let me ask you, when you go home from this pilgrimage to Jewish Mecca, vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem, and... <laughs> And you sit down at the table with your family, and they say, Dad or Mom, how was your day? Are you going to say, oh, nothing much happened? This is life-changing stuff here. And so this group of people shot out to all the known world, and they carried the gospel with them everywhere they went. It's just an amazing thing. It's a model for us. More on that in just a moment. So I want to talk to you about the singular purpose of Pentecost. Not all the stuff that we can argue about, create our own ideas about, but what is clearly said with an undeniable word of God thing that, that we can all just say, yes, that's what God says about this. I'm talking about something very clear that we can easily say this is the main purpose for Pentecost. That's what I'm talking about. What is that? All the other important things that we associate with that day, and I don't want you to get me wrong on this stuff because I believe this stuff, but things like heart purity, death of the sin nature, even entire sanctification for that matter, those are all important theological realities. And we read, we read about those later, though, after this. Those realities get perceived about Pentecost, and rightly so, as we try to figure out what happened. That in this moment right here, no one's thinking those things. No one's thinking about the theological ramifications of being filled with the Holy Spirit. They're living in this moment. And so if they're living in this moment without the clutter of denominational differences, you know, if they can just be free of that because they're experiencing this in reality, then we ought to just listen to what's to this. And maybe get our marching orders, if you will, or our ideas about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, maybe get our ideas from that, from those that were there who were experiencing it, instead of all the books that have been written about it. This book is never wrong. This is the holy and errant word of God. This isn't the word of Pastor Scott. This isn't the word of Pastor Adam. I love the word of Pastor Adam. I mean, I really do. And I know you do. But this, this is the word of God. Let's, let's listen in on this a little bit. So, main thing to understand that happened at Pentecost is God got inside of us and made us his witnesses. 
I mean, that, that, but, but, so then the question remains for us, and then we're going to kind of close talking about this now. What does it mean to be witnesses in this context? I don't mean to be unkind, but the church has gotten some pretty wacky ideas about what witnessing is over the years. I have this guy named Alan. Oh, I can't think of his last name. When I was attending God's Bible School, he, he, he was sharing with us one time that, that he had this Sunday school teacher who wanted to train the, the kids in evangelism. And so they were going to go to the mall. Where you know wherever they were they were living somewhere in the south he had a really long southern drawl, and and so the Sunday school teacher took them to the mall and she had these witnessing tracks. Don't get offended now. She had had these witnessing tracks rolled up in red construction paper with a little wick sticking out of it so it looked like a stick of dynamite, and and they drove past the mall. They didn't even go in. They drove past the mall and threw them at people and she'd say, bomb them, boys! In the name of the Lord! And everyone on the sidewalk fell down and gave their life to Jesus. You know better. You know better. <laughs> and, and Now, that when I say that, church has come up with some wacky ideas about witnessing. That is an extreme one. I, I get that. It really is. But we sometimes we do everything but what witnessing really is supposed to be. And we've had books written about it. We've had I remember uh, we, in our discipleship class when we became Christians we, became, we had uh, Bill Bright's Witnessing Without Fear. That was a that was a big thing in the church for a while. And I'm not knocking any of that. I'm just saying that this seems like every generation has these anchoring kind of books that everything centers around. And really, the whole none of them really get this. So let's look at what's happening here. Jerusalem, I'm, I'm reflecting back now, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what happened at Pentecost. We were made witnesses because God was now in us. And we were to be his witnesses, carry him and his word to all of these places. What would, what would these places mean to the people who were there? Not us. But what would it mean to the people who were there? Jerusalem, that's their hometown. That's where this group of disciples, 120 or so of them, that's where they were from. They were, the vast majority of them were from Jerusalem. So they were to carry the God inside of them, and they were to declare, last part of verse 11, the wonders of God. You ever done that when you witnessed? Declared the wonders of God. In their hometown of Jerusalem, then in Judea, well, that's a surrounding area, we might say. So, so they, were to, they were to carry the word of God inside of them and be witnesses by sharing the wonders of God to their hometown and to the surrounding area in Judea. And then the next place is Samaria. What? what? Samaria? <laughs> we hate those people. And what's worse, they hate us. Samaria? Why, why would... I don't want to go to Samaria. It's a place where you don't want to go. That's Samaria. It's a place where you hope you never set foot in. That's our Samaria. Just might be where we need to be our move the most. Just food for thought. So our hometown, the surrounding area, the places that we don't want to go, and then to the ends of the earth. Some of us will be called to missions. 
and we'll go to the end of the year. I'm the district missionary president of my district. That part of this verse is very near and dear to me. We go to the ends of the earth. And we carry the God that enters us when we get filled with the Holy Spirit and we become his witnesses. And what does witnessing mean? That out of our mouths and out of our lives come the wonders of God. not here. Take a track. We love you. Come to church. We'll be back in two weeks. Do it again. Okay, they didn't come. Let's move on. Isn't that a wonderful message for some people? Invite them to church a couple times and if they don't come, you move on. What does that say to them? (laughs) That you are not the least bit interested in them. That you, You don't care about them at all. You just wanted to get them in church. And the proof of it is when you didn't go, you never saw him again. I'm telling you, we have this witnessing idea wrong. Spirit-filled people carry the wonders of God. I mean, all you have to do is share the wonders of God with people. You don't have to dream up some big program. You don't have to pressure yourself into getting all the words right. Do you have the wonders of God alive in your life? Any of you? Do you have the wonders of God alive in you? And if you don't, let's start there. Let's let's fix that. Because if you don't have the wonders of God alive in you, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the only real way to authenticate, uh, you know, one whole group of people have sprung off from this, and they've created one of these outward manifestations as proof that the person's filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you the only real way to authenticate that someone is filled with the Holy Spirit is that they are exploding with the wonders of God. (laughs) And all the people around them, whether it be in their hometown, whether it be in the surrounding area, whether it be in some place they don't want to go, or whether they're called to be a missionary somewhere on the other side of the globe, a spirit-filled person is overflowing with the wonders of God. That is what happened at Pentecost. And that is the single purpose of God getting inside of us. Say, Pastor Scott, where are you coming up with this? <laughs> I wish I was had enough intelligence to come up with but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. That is, God came up with this. This is what God was doing when he filled the church on day one with his Holy Spirit very first day of the existence of the church age began with God being so personal that he got inside of us and he wants us to carry him wherever we go so that there can be these moments where there's so much of him inside of us it just explodes all over everybody. Sounds kind of messy, doesn't it? But So I asked you tonight to close me. And we're running a little late, thank you. Why don't you stand with me, would you? Do you guys have some music that we can play just about anything? Yeah. You go ahead and work on that. I just want to—I just want to share with you in closing. Is it possible? I mean, would you would you would you be courageous enough? And and if you're already just just don't you can't be harmed by this. Okay, it's not you. It just is. This is risk-free. Would you be brave enough tonight to examine before God whether or not you really are filled with the Holy Spirit? Is it possible that you thought you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, but maybe you're not? I I mean, that, that can happen. Is it possible that you once were filled with the Holy Spirit, and now you're not? Is it possible that you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit? 
filled with the Holy Spirit. We understand tonight that, that being filled with Him is key to everything. This is the normal way for a, a believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit and carry the wonders of God. With you. That's what a testimony is. Did, did, what would change in your life? What would change in your family's lives and those that you quote-unquote witness to if instead of uh, preaching at them, instead of saying words and little jabs that seem condemning because of, all the, of how evil and awful they are, if you just simply shared the wonders of God with them? I mean, what are they going to say if you, if you say, well, you just wouldn't believe doing in my life. Trust me, that's going to have a bigger impact on them than any tract that has ever been written, uh, any plan of evangelism that mankind has ever come up with. It's a simple sharing the wonders of God. And if you have the wonders of God in your life, you can't help but share it. And if you don't have the wonders of God in your life, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit in this moment right now anyway. I'm going to give you an opportunity tonight because I don't want to be irresponsible. God has put all this together. God has brought us to this moment. And if I just cut you loose and say go home, I'll be disobedient to God because he wants you to have an opportunity to respond to this. You're not responding to me. Don't respond to me. Unless you want to give me a hug afterwards. I'll take that. But you're responding to God. Come and be filled or come and be refilled. Why don't you come to the altar? You want to be filled or refilled? You're here tonight. You need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. This is your time to do this. Come on up. God bless you. Come right up here.